Hi guys, welcome to another Get Some episode with your sommelier Danielle Linda with 5 to Wine Time. Today we are going to get some wines of Rioja. Uh, people ask me what my favorite wine region is and I always say Rioja even though I've never visited. I love the wine and the culture and the history of Spain and the wine region of Rioja itself. Um, their whites, their reds, their dessert wines, just everything excites me about that region and I just can't imagine a happier place for myself than walking in Haro, enjoying tapas, the siesta, the wines, and walking over the river and going to one of my favorite go-to wine re uh, wineries, which is the uh, Cune Portfolio, and tasting their wines there. I, I can ramble about Rioja and how I love about their wines, but then I don't know what my guest of today's call would be talking about. So I am so happy to have Lucia Perez Ramos here. She is the United States manager for Cune. Thank you so much. I am so sorry that we can't be drinking together. Um, we're filming this in the middle of COVID, but we'll, we'll socially distance drink the wines of your, your beautiful portfolio. So thank you so much. Uh, for getting up early and um, spending some time with me talking about your great wine. So I will, I will let you lead the way. Hey, well, Daniel, first of all, uh, thank you so much for, you know, um, having me and inviting <laughs> me to talk about the wines. Um, I guess this is the new, you know, reality for you know many of us doing everything virtually versus the last time we saw each other and were able to, you know, drink and talk wine, um, yeah. you know, back in, back in Chicago. That was so um, nice. Miss so it. So I'll, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so I'll give you um, a little bit of the background um, on the winery, the history of the winery. Great. So um, Cune, um, the winery, it was founded back in 1879. Um, it was founded by two brothers, Eusebio mm -hmm. and Raimundo uh, Real de Azua. They moved from Bilbao, the northern part of Spain, down to Rioja due to some, uh, uh, you know, con health condition that one of the brothers had. Mm. Uh, the doctors actually recommended them to move from Bilbao down to Rioja, as Rioja had a slightly lighter uh, and better weather, let's say, than, than Bilbao. Okay. One, uh, once they, uh, you know, established themselves in Rioja, um, the wine business really started to flourish. And it was because the, you know, the phylloxera, this was like in the 19th century, the phylloxera had killed all the vineyard uh, already in the northern part of Europe and in France. Uh, Spain hadn't been hit by the phylloxera yet. So a lot of French negociants from Bordeaux were actually coming to Rioja mm. to uh, purchase our wine to be able to fulfill their international demand because they had been left with no vineyards um, whatsoever. So uh, the Real de, uh, Real de Azua brothers, uh, they decided to, you know, start in the, in, the, in the wine business as this was like the new opportunity for the region. So they established themselves in the small city of Aro. And mm -hmm. if you, this was back in 1879. And if you go back to that time, there is a handful of wineries that really started um, at the same time. Uh, some of our neighbors that, you know, are really next door to us that are families that have also been there for over a hundred years. Uh, the reason uh, why we uh, established ourselves in Aro, it's because we wanted to be close to the railway station. So mm. the winery is literally by the train station. And the reason for this was, again, to be able to ship our wine as soon as possible, as fast as possible to France to fulfill the 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 demand from you know uh, French negotiants. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you can say Rioja really started um, to learn and uh, to have a, a wine style very similar to Bordeaux, uh, because that's okay. what was needed uh, back in the day. Um, fast forward a hundred what forty years later for for the family. Uh, Cune is still owned by the same family. Mm -hmm. It's actually the fifth generation that runs the family today. Uh, brother and sister Maria and Victor, they are hands on at the winery every single day. Um, and they have grown their property, uh, not only to Cune in Aro, but mm -hmm. also two other properties in Rioja. One of them is Viña Real, uh, that was founded in 1920. The other property in Rioja was founded in 1973. 
that was the first single vineyard in Rioja. It's called Contino. Mm. And they also produce in Rioja Imperial, which is our most iconic wine. And also, uh, it was top number one from one spec wine spectator in 2013. So definitely a reference for Rioja and for Spain. And we also have some other small projects outside of Rioja, like in Ribera del Duero, mm -hmm. in Valdorras, uh, in Penedes, so Cava region, the Canary Islands. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the, you know, Maria and Victor are very active, as I said, with the winery and really trying to explore other regions mm -hmm. and bringing their know-how from 140 years uh, to other regions of Spain. That is, it's just amazing how one family can and change the wine world a little bit and being generational and keeping that tradition going. And it's, it's just amazing that it just keeps going and keeps going and the histories and went through world wars, but you're still making beautiful wines there. One of them is the Monopole wine, uh, which is your white wine from Rioja, which not a lot of people know. There's some great wines coming out of Rioja. Um, and it's the Viura grape. So it's just, I'm excited for us to taste through. So we have the Monopole, we have the uh, Cune Crianza, and then as you said, you, we have that star of your portfolio, an Imperial Reserva. So I'm really excited for us to taste through. Um, I, I got ahead of myself and I poured myself a couple glasses. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit early for me here, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise to take tiny sips. <laughs> but um, so our first wine is the, the Monopole, and it, it's actually served in the... Uh, Bottles that we usually see Rieslings in Alsatian and in German wines. Is there a reason why the family back in 1920 decided to go with this style of bottle? I know that they were working with Bordeaux, but um, this is very Alsatian and German. I didn't know if there was a meaning behind it or it was what's available. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's funny that you pick that up. A lot of people also are surprised. They say, wow, that's a very unusual uh, style of bottle for a Spanish white or for a Rioja white. So as you said, Monopole, um, the first vintage of Monopole was in 1915. Oh, okay. And was, yeah, and it was the first commercially white wine in Spain. So the mm. first time ever a white wine was sold with a label was actually Monopole from Cunin. Wow. Um, and there is no, I mean, there, there are no records or anything written down on why they chose this style of bottle. However, if you see pictures and drawings from the very first time this wine was released, mm -hmm. um, it has always come in a ring, in a, you know, tall bottle. Yeah. And what we, what the family believes is that uh, the brothers, Eusebio and Raimundo, they did travel a lot to France. Uh, to learn, to gather ideas, um, to buy equipment, you know, whatever, wine-related, they would take several trips to France a year. Um, so we just think they got inspired by Alsatian whites and the bottle shape mm. and decided to bottle monopole in that type of bottle. If you look at Piña Real, which is our uh, property in Rioja Alavesa, uh, it comes in a, those wines come in a burgundy bottle um, oh. versus in a Bordeaux bottle. Normally in Rioja, all the wines come in a Bogdo style of bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been more um, in the last few years that you see the Burgundy bottles being, um, you know, uh, yes. that you see them in Rioja, but we've had them in Viña Real since the 20s. And it's the same, you know, I think the same reason as, as Monaco. Um, I think they just, the brothers just went there, they liked the shape and they wanted to do something different. And it's yeah. been like that for, over a hundred years. Over a hundred years. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah. it, it's just interesting that we, we know, I guess as wine cork dorks, we notice those kinds of things of the shapes of bottles and do you use a twist off or a glass closing or cork? And it, it just, it caught my eye and I was like, hmm, I wonder why. And you've done monopole in the tradition of the, was it the hundred year anniversary where you guys actually pulled one of the recipes? Um, I remember us tasting the Seco together, and I just I loved how you guys are able to hold on to those pieces of history and then share them on the bottle with us, us cork yeah, dorks. Exactly. So the monopole that you have uh, with you and mm -hmm. on your glass in your glass right now, that's that's our. It's the 2019. It's our current release. It's 100% Buda variety, which is the queen of the grapes of white grapes in 
to mm. Yoha. Uh, it's a, it's a grape that I really like because it has, you know, because of the soils, it has great minerality, some floral aromas, uh, good acidity, uh, mm. some stone fruit aromas. And it's actually a wine that can age, um, you know, for a few years. Um, it's a wine that doesn't have any oak. Uh, it's all stainless steel, but it is aged on the leaves for a few months. So it gives the wine a little bit more texture and, and weight on the palate. It's just really beautiful. But as you can imagine, in these hundred years of history, it's mm -hmm. also a wine that has changed mm -hmm. um, so much in style and that the family and the different winemakers have uh, done different things. So the wine that you were referring to before mm -hmm. is our Monopoly Classico. Mm. And, and exactly, that's what it is. It's, it's kind of like a throwback on how Monopoly used to be in the 60s. Um, so it's a limited edition that we did um, to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of, of Monopoly. And we did it the same way, as I said, that it was done in the 60s, where uh, we blended Viura and mm -hmm. other white wine varieties that exist in Rioja mm -hmm. with a little bit of Manzanilla sherry mm -hmm. from the south of Spain. Okay. Uh, as you know, Manzanilla sherry is the driest of the sherries, mm -hmm. so it's not a sweet sherry. Right. So the wine is still 100% bone dry. Um, and uh, we release that wine uh, every year. We've been releasing it since we released it for the first time uh, three, four mm -hmm. years ago uh, on very limited productions. So you will always find Monopole, which is what you have right mm -hmm. there, and then Monopole Classico, which is that other um, kind of like style, kind of like throwback. Throwback. Uh, style of Monopole, Cause, yeah. Because you got to remember where you came from to move forward, which I think is really nice. Um, speaking yeah. of moving forward, we're going to go to a really nice youthful red wine. We have the uh, Cune 2016 uh, Crianza. Um, I think this was my first ever uh, wine of from Rioja, and it was just, I smelled it, and it was just so aromatic and so expressive, and, and it just got me excited about red wines, especially from Spain, being um, a Midwest girl myself. I have not gotten to travel a lot of the world, but in a glass, you can travel, and you can be in Rioja, and I think that was what just took me there with the glass, so... All you about uh, the Cune line. Yeah, well, first of all, I have to say that I actually love the fact that you say that it's a wine that takes you back mm -hmm. or takes you to Rioja, takes you to Spain, or and takes you to Rioja specifically because um, this is, you know, if you talk to Maria Larrea, who is our winemaker, she'll always say that Cune Crianza is actually the hardest wine to produce, right? Really? Because when you have... Um, you know, Imperial, for example, uh, we use, you know, three plots that have uh, very old, uh, very old vines. We use new oak, uh, mm -hmm. top-notch technology, and, you know, everything is the best, the best, the best to create this iconic wine. Mm -hmm. And then Cune Crianza, it's kind of like that wine that it has to be an everyday style of wine, uh, but it takes much more to produce. Uh, it's more difficult to produce and to make it, you know, to have that kind of like sense of place yeah. than, you know, when you put all your, all your kind of like the best of the best into the, the most iconic wine. No, right. this is a wine that we release every vintage. Mm -hmm. So Imperial Reserva, for example, if it's not a great vintage, we will not release the wine. Okay. But Crianza, it's a wine that even if it's not a very good vintage, we still have to release this wine because it's the bread and butter of the winery mm. and we have to you know uh, make sure that it's of, of great quality so it takes much more uh, to produce a wine like this and um, to me it's one of my you know go-to's uh, in the Cune portfolio I love something that my mom always says that it's like Cune Crianza is the type of wine that is always open on your kitchen counter uh, you know, no matter what, you always have a, a, a bottle of Cune Crianza open, open in your kitchen because, you know, you get ha uh, home from work at lunch and you need a glass of wine, Cune Crianza. You're cooking and you want a glass of wine, Cune Crianza. You know, it's just a very easy to drink uh, red wine, but at the same time, it has layers and complexity and a really, really strong sense of place. Um, really and it never disappoints. 
It, it has never disappointed me. And I think your mom and I have the same kitchen counter then because I always have one of these bottles on my counter because, as you said, it is such an easy drink. You open it up. It doesn't need to be decanted. It doesn't need time to age because it's already as expressive as you want a Crianza to be in the glass. And it's so affordable that I like to use it as, for somebody who's never drank Rioja before or never experienced Tempranillo or Granacha or anything from Spain, I always use this bottle as kind of my, my little dip into the water of Rioja that you get a little bit of bulk, you get a little bit of youth, you get all the complexity in the glass and that it's kind of a nice gate or a dip in the toe or a gateway, <laughs> almost a drug, a gateway wine into Rioja. Um, but the dark red fruits and you guys still use a little bit of oak on it, if I'm not mistaken, because that's what Crianza means, correct? Exactly. We use, so this is the 2016 vintage, mm -hmm. which is our current release. Uh, so again, boom, uh, crazy. Uh, it's a Crianza. It's on the shelf for 14, 15 bucks. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, and we're in 2020, you know, so it's, uh, right. uh, you do get a lot of wine. Um, so yes, being a Crianza, we age it in oak for 12 months. Uh, we use American oak, and uh, we never use 100% um, new oak for Cune Crianza. So it's a more traditional, a, a more classic style of Rioja. Um, the idea is not to have wines that um, show a lot of the oak, mm -mm. Uh, but really that show the fruit. So the mm -hmm. aging and the terroir. So the aging in the oak, it's more kind of like for the oxygenation purposes, mm -hmm. give it a little bit that. So it's mostly Tempranillo, mm -hmm. uh, but it also uses a little bit of Carnacha, a little bit of Graciano, um, and a little bit of Mazuelo. Mm. Uh, so we, as I said, this is kind of like the bread and butter of the winery. All of our fruit is a state fruit, uh, so we don't purchase any fruit or any um, wine from, from the cooperative or, mm -hmm. or uh, farmers. Um, and at the winery, we produce Crianza Reserva and Gran Reserva. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those that have a chance to find the wines, uh, it's always really cool to be able to see, you know, the Crianza and then the Reserva and then the Gran Reserva, how the wine, um, you know, how different it can be with the aging and the fruit and, and the winemaking techniques for each, for each category. And with Cune, with the Reserva and the Gran Reserva, um, the family, do they taste the wine and th will they hold on to it until they know that it's ready to go into the glass? Or when it comes to releasing the Imperials and the Cunes of the Grand Reserves and Reservas, will they release it to the public for them to store? Or do they already do the best part, which is holding on to that wine until it's already expressive, ready to go? Because that is one of the parts of the winemaking that people don't think about is that some wineries hold on to these wines for 10, 20, 30 years before doing a release because they know finally the wine is ready to go. I didn't know if um, Cune is one of those wineries that does that style of practicing, of wait wait for it. I promise it'll be good. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, because we are located in Rioja, uh, by law, if we wanna uh, name our wines uh, under the categories Crianza, Reserva, and Gran Reserva, mm -hmm. we must, by law, do some of that aging for the final right. consumer. So Crianza, minimum two years of aging. Mm -hmm. Reserva, minimum three years of aging. Gran Reserva, minimum five years of aging. And these are years, the minimum aging before you can actually release the wine. Mm. And it's all a mix of bottle time and barrel. Barrel. So it's oak and bottle. So to that, to your point, mm -hmm. absolutely, we do age our wines uh, before we release them for quite a long time. Uh, this allows the tannins too and the oak to integrate the wine to be more smooth mm -hmm. and be more ready to drink and, and really be you know more elegant, more subtle, uh, softer. Uh, at the same time, Rioja is actually a wine region, and for us in Cune, that has a huge potential for aging. Um, we have wines, I've tasted wines from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, from Rioja, and from Cune, Imperial, Viña Real, 
una gran reserva and they age really really nicely uh, you want to do this aging with normally reservas or gran reservas mm -hmm. uh, because our wines that um, you know the nature of those those wines will allow them to um, age uh, you know much longer and if you actually I just remember something so bear with me for yeah. one second I'll show you something Ooh, love seeing surprises just gonna drink more wine So these are, you know, hard to find, but I just got a present from someone and they sent me, this is Viña Real, our property Whoa. in Rojalavesta. So that's 1975. Oh my yeah. gosh. So, um, wow. so yeah, they're not easy to find. So I'm, uh, you know, it's a precious, pre precious present that I received. <laughs> um, and, but these wines can age for, for a very long time. They're absolutely ready to drink mm -hmm. upon release. Um, but if you want to put them down in your cellar for a few more years, you'll absolutely benefit from, from it. enjoying, you know, a gem. Yes. I, 19, I, yep. I can't even tell you what I was doing in 1975 because I, I wasn't alive <laughs> yet. Um, but I think that's what's so great about wine is that it is that time capsule in a bottle and that when you're ready to release it as a wine collector or in your cellar or you have somebody like myself as your sommelier, as your, your librarian of your wines, Riojas are those wines that you can invest in early and not spend thousands and hundreds of dollars even, but you have such a beautiful expression come with what, if you wanted to open up that 75 today, you would still have some fruit notes, but those earthy notes would just come through so gorgeously because of the American oak and the the graceful period of aging it in a barrel before putting it in a bottle. So that that got me nerdy. <laughs> um, oh, I love old wine. I love opening time capsules. But um, speaking of those beautiful agings and those wines, we are on our third wine, which is that Imperial, um, is the 2015 Reserva. Um, Imperial and it's this is your current release correct of the Imperial mm -hmm. of the Reserva and then you have the 2011 is your Grand Reserva release is yeah, your current we have 11 and we also have 12 already in the market okay the Grand Reserva. yeah we have 11 and 12 um, for Imperial we didn't release any 13 mm. uh, so both the Reserva and the Gran Reserva will jump from 2012 to 2014. Okay. Uh, 2013 was a really difficult year in Rioja, so mm -hmm. we didn't, uh, the, the, the family didn't feel that, uh, you know, the Imperial should be released mm -hmm. that year. 2014 uh, got a little bit better. We were able to release um, some Imperial. 2015 was a really, really gorgeous uh, vintage. Uh, so I'm very happy that we are already in 2015 for Imperial Reserva. Mm -hmm. um, as I was saying, Imperial, it's, a, it's our most iconic brand. Uh, it's always, you know, when it comes to ratings, it always gets great ratings and great scores. Um, it was number one from One Spectator a few years ago. Uh, which is crazy because no one, no other Spanish wine has ever been number one so far in the history of the top 100 wow. on the Imperial. And um, the release price, it was $63 back then. It was in 2013. That's which is crazy. crazy. Yeah, because all the number ones are like 100 plus, 200 plus, right? Uh, well, Imperial has gotten a little bit more expensive since then for many reasons that are not mm, our fault, uh, <laughs> but it's still, you know, maybe in the 70s, in the 80s, so not a crazy price. Uh, the, the Imperial Reserva, however, is half of that, about 50 bucks. Right. 40 bucks, right? So still very affordable. Um, also, the, the current king and queen of Spain, uh, when they got married, they served Imperial Reserva uh, on their wedding, uh, you know, dinner yeah uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a big reference it's a big iconic wine for us uh, it's a brand that we started um, in the 20s as well for the first mm -hmm. time it was a special bottling done for uh, for the UK uh, and it was bottled on an imperial pint size bottle so half a liter 
Oh, and that's why the name is Imperial. We, we say Imperial, but it would be Imperial, okay. right from the from the Brits. Yes. Uh, Imperial Pine Side Container. Uh, as I said, it's a wine that comes from our um, kind of like top vineyards in Rioja mm. Alta. It comes from three different plots that have our, um, you know, oldest um, vines of Tempranillo, Graciano, Mazuelo, and Garnacha. So this is also a blend of the four main varieties that you find in Rioja. Uh, it's a wine that we age 100% in new oak. We okay. use both French and American oak uh, for this wine. And then it has a uh, bottle time before it gets released. Okay. Um, so it's a wine that has, you know, again, a lot of layers, a lot of complexity, uh, a wine that opens up really, really nicely. I mean, it changes on your glass yes. dramatically and it's just beautiful as the evening or, you know, lunchtime, whatever <laughs> goes by. See the wine uh, changing and opening up. Um, I always tell people when I'm homesick, I always open a bottle of Imperial because it takes me like right back home. I mean, I open Imperial more often than that, but especially <laughs> when I get homesick, I'm yeah. like, ah. Oh. Yeah, I just need to drink Imperial. It really you know, like helps me to be closer to home. It, it really does. I, I opened it before we started because I wanted one to let it breathe and come to its full characteristics. And at first it smelled of those red fruits and black fruit notes. But now as I'm smelling it after we've been talking, I get that beautiful, like you're walking in a forest, the wet forest floor, the wet leaves after a rainfall. It just, it's earthy, it's hearty, it's... It is. I guess that is what your home is. It, it brings you those warm and fuzzy feelings. Um, just reminds me of a fall day and the crisp air and it just and the idea of how much love is even put into this. And it's still a bottle of wine that's under a hundred dollars, but it is expressive and it has such value. And I think that's what people don't realize is there's such beautiful value and expressions in the Rioja region. I feel it's kind of a little bit of a secret in the Psalm world of kind of our go-tos to drinking because I, I don't drink first growths on a daily basis, but I will drink Rioja any day of the week because it, it's ready to drink and it's meant to be drank and enjoyed. Um, you can be patient with it and be like that 75, but you can drink the 15 and you have still so much expression and so much love into the bottle so i'm really yay and the elegance on the palette is there too it's just there's structure but it's not overwhelming and it, it it's so pleasant and it's just so i with riojas you have that history and the imperial and the british do you see the American culture finally jumping on board with what England knew all those years ago of the great wines of Spain, or is this still a learning, a little bit of a learning curve for the American um, wine society, I guess? Yeah, I, I think we're still, you know, way behind uh, France and, and Italy when mm -hmm. it comes to, you know, um, uh, the knowledge of the of the people, no, about our wines uh, and our food. I think you know the the French and the Italians did a much better job opening restaurants, for example, in the United States, and therefore bringing and introducing their wines along, you know, with uh, with those restaurants and making them, you know, giving access to a lot of people through food mm -hmm. to get to their wines. And I think to for us, uh, we didn't do that, you know, in with Spain, you don't find a lot of Spanish restaurants still. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think people are learning and people are getting uh, to understand our wines and also to see that you get a lot of wine for the for the money. Mm -hmm. That it's a country to go to if you you know want great quality wine, but uh, for a price that you know people can afford. It's also a country that it's um, you know Spain is producing great wines. Uh, Rioja is probably the most well known region because. Uh, it's a, it's a very popular region. It's probably the region that was introduced to the United States, um, you know, uh, many years ago. But there are some other more um, obscure or smaller wine regions in Spain that are producing, you know, beautiful wines, bringing uh, other varieties, um, or, you know, also traditional varieties, um, uh, you know, back to kind of life and bringing those to the United States. So I think people, little by little, are... Um, 
are you know are, are getting uh, curious and are enjoying our wines more and more mm-hmm. so we hope you know to continue that trend yes. uh, and you know we would love for everybody to to drink Spanish wine of course mm-hmm. um, but yeah uh, let's let, <laughs> I want them to enjoy it and I want them to experience it, but I also want to keep it a secret at some times because I'm just like, yeah, yeah, no, me too, me too. <laughs> don't tell anyone about Rioja. Don't tell them about the amazing wines of Kuna because then I won't be able to afford them. Uh- <laughs> and I want to keep my job, you know, and I tell people, I, you know, fine. I don't, you know, I don't want to sure. sell everything, <laughs> everything we have, but, uh, no, but it's true. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful country, and hopefully, you know, I mean, now it's hard to travel and go and explore, but um, you know, hopefully, soon enough, people will be able to come back again. And we um, receive visitors every year uh, at the winery, and we love hosting. Uh, so you know, we we look forward to those times again. I know COVID has definitely made us realize that. Take, that traveling is so important to us as a society and how we learn and we learn history. And right now, the only way for us to travel is with one glass at a time or one bottle at a time. And hopefully soon enough, you and I will be able to drink again together um, and celebrate the Rioja wines and especially Kune. Um, I'll find us a tapas place. I promise. I'll find us a good... I'll, I'll do the research for us until you can come. Um, I, I will take on that burden of uh, tapas hunting uh, in Chicago. So thank you so, so much, Lucia, for helping us or helping myself as well as everyone who will be watching this, the appreciation and the art and the history of Kune and how family traditions are still a thing and they're not going anywhere and that we can all enjoy Rioja wines without breaking the bank or... <laughs> We're ruining the budget while we're all, you know, quarantined at home. So thank you so, so much again for taking the time to introduce us and getting us some um, wines of Rioja. So it is five to wine time. So please grab yourself a glass of Rioja. I promise you won't regret it. Um, Find Kune. As as me and Lucia said, this is an amazing crianza to drink any day of the week. It does not have to be a special occasion, but it can be. Um, it can be Monday, who knows? So please grab yourself a glass and I will see you guys next time. Cheers. Uh